Our scripture uh, reading this morning is uh, taken from Paul's second letter uh, to the church in uh, Corinth, uh, chapter 12. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, for no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weaknesses. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. Whenever, whenever there's a group, uh, individuals involved in a study of prayer, uh, a sermon series on the topic of prayer, there's a question that almost always comes up. Either Someone says it aloud, or it's implied, or even, well, just thought. It's built upon statements like this, and I will, it's built on statements like this. Didn't Jesus stay? Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Yes, he did. Didn't Jesus say, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you? Yes, he said that. Didn't he say that? But the implied question is, why didn't I get what I asked for? Now, we oftentimes use the title, you use the phrase, unanswered prayer, but as Morgan was pushing me towards, all prayer is answered. Sometimes the answer is no, is no. Why? Why? I've been praying for a husband to stop drinking, and he hasn't. I've been praying for a job, and I don't have one. I've been praying for my friend, my relative, my neighbor to be healed, and they haven't been healed. I've been praying for guidance, but no guidance has come. Anybody ever prayed anything like that? Anybody ever had that kind of experience? Well, that's silly for me to even ask that question because, yes, we've probably, probably all been in that boat. I think this is a good place to interject something that C.S. Lewis uh, said. He wrote a little book, amongst all of his books, he uh, wrote a little book called Letters to Malcolm, Chiefly on Prayer. Just a little tiny, tiny text. And in it he says, perhaps the greater problem is, why was the Lord so extravagant in his promises about prayer? Why was he so extravagant? I think he wanted to encourage us to pray. He wanted us to know that God really wants us to pray and God really wants to grant our petitions. 
But the fact of the matter is it's sometimes they're not granted. Quite a few years ago, way, way back, actually in the early 1980s, uh, in a little book uh, written by uh, Dr. Robert Schuler, I ran across this little explanation, so to say, about unanswered, ungranted petitions. About 25 years ago, Bill Hybos wrote a little book called Too Busy Not to Pray, and he quoted it. He didn't give Schuler credit for it, but he said, others have said. Well, I'll just say, others have said this morning. These words that perhaps may help you, may help us get a little better understanding about ungranted petitions. It goes like this, I'm sure, well, it's kind of small print, but maybe you can see it. If the request is wrong, God will say no. If the timing is wrong, God will say slow. Can you hear Bob Schuler? If the timing is wrong, God will say slow. If you are wrong, God will say grow. And if the request is right, the timing is right, and you are right, God will say go, go, go. I want to look for just a few moments at each one of these statements briefly and uh, sort of uh, expound on them for just a little bit. Let's begin with, if the request is wrong, God will say no. It's possible, it is possible for us to ask God to do something that is just simply contrary to the character, to the nature, to the will of God. And God will just say no. I won't do that. For example, for example, we delve into the, to the New Testament. Jesus took Peter, James, and John. They went to the top of a mountain. We don't really know which one of those mountains in the northern part of the country it was, but they went to this mountain, and while they were up there, Jesus was praying, and his appearance was transfigured before their very eyes. The glory of God came upon him, and he, his radiance shone like the splendor of the brightest sunshine you've ever seen in your life. And Moses and Elijah, the great prophets, appeared with him in that glorious experience. And Peter said, Jesus, do this. Let us build dwellings right up here and let us spend the rest of our lives on the top of this mountain just basking in the glow of this appearance. Give us this, Jesus. Let us do this. And Jesus said, no. That's not what I want to do. That's not what I came to do. You're asking for the entire wrong thing at this point in time. It's just, it's just wrong. I got more to do. In fact, there's a boy waiting at the bottom of the hill that needs their help. There's a cross waiting in Jerusalem. And Jesus is going to remind them about that when they get to the bottom of the hill. It's just the wrong thing to ask for. In our ignorance, in our selfishness, we sometimes just simply ask God for the wrong thing. We just ask God for the wrong thing. I, I haven't talked about this in the other two services, honey, but you know, Garth Brooks has that old country song about some of God's greatest blessings are unanswered prayers. He goes to an old high school football game. Years later, he sees the, what was the love of his life. He prayed and asked God to give her to him, and it didn't happen. And now he says, oh, thank God. <laughs> Sometimes when we think about the foolish things that we've asked for, the things that are very selfish and self-fulfilling, Jesus said, if your motivation is wrong, God's going to say no. Sometimes that's what's behind an un 
answered ungranted prayer. Sometimes, if the timing is wrong, God may say, slow down. Not yet. Wait a minute. We may get to that a little later. Parents do this all the time. Any of you who are mothers of uh, daughters, or those of you who are daughters of mothers may remember this experience. When she said, they said, you said, Mom, everybody else is wearing hosiery. Boy, that's an old term, isn't it? Stockings and makeup to school and to the dance. I want to. And mom says, not yet. Not yet. You're not ready for that yet. Not yet. The time may come. The time will come. But not yet. But dad, I'll be 16 in just another month. Can I just back the car out and run it up and down the street once, for goodness sake? The cops never come around here. Not yet. Let's, let's go slow. Let's wait. Let's wait. Grandma's birthday present arrives via UPS three days before the birthday. Can I open it now? Huh, 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 please, please. Can I open it now? Huh, huh, please. Nope, not yet. It's not your birthday. Let's wait. Let's wait. Let's wait. Good parents sometimes, not being vindictive, not being frivolous, not trying to be difficult, say, no, let's just wait. It's not the right time. For centuries, for centuries, the people of Israel prayed for a Messiah. God, let the Messiah come this year. And the Apostle Paul, <clears throat> in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, says, When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman. God just simply said, it's not the right time yet. In his wisdom, in his understanding. Sometimes, if the timing's not right, God may say, not yet. Slow down. Let's just wait a bit. The third thing, <clears throat> the third answer that's sometimes given for when prayers are not granted is if you're wrong, if we're wrong in some way, God may say, you need to do some growing. You need to do some changing. There needs to be some transformation in your life. The psalmist in Psalm 66, verse 18 says, If I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Now that's a hard one to hear for us. But it simply says that sometimes sin in our lives can act as a barrier, a barricade, and it can impede the willingness of God to grant our petitions, sin. Jesus, talking to his disciples in Matthew chapter five, says, if you, <coughs> if you have a gift that you're gonna bring to the altar, and sometimes that gift was a, a sacrifice, which was a prayer for God's forgiveness, or sometimes that was a, a incense, that was a, a prayer that was being offered to God. <coughs> when you're bringing your petition, to the altar, and you remember that there's something hinky about your relationship with a brother or a sister, just put the sacrifice down for just a, a minute and go and make peace. Be reconciled and then come back and lift up your petition. 
Make your sacrifice, give your gift. Conflict between ourselves and other persons. Jesus was implying can be an impediment to the granting of our prayers. We're supposed to be the people who forgive others as God has forgiven us in Christ. Did not Jesus say, if we don't forgive, neither will God forgive you? You can pray for forgiveness till your tongue drops off. But if you're not willing to forgive others, And in 1 Peter chapter 3, now this one hits really close to home. In 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter said, Husbands, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Grant them honor so that your prayers won't be hindered. That's one of the most important relationships, interpersonal relationships. Now, just to be fair, I think Peter could have put the shoe on the other foot, don't you? Ladies, come on now. Yeah. Some kind of difficulty in a relationship. Our relationship with God, our relationship with another person. If it's just not right can act as an impediment to prayer. James, the brother of Jesus, said, the prayers of a righteous person, the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. And I think we can equally say, the prayers of an unrighteous person may be weak and ineffective. Weak and ineffective. If we are wrong, if there's something wrong in our lives, God may be saying, think about that. Think about yourself. Think about your relationship with me. Think about your relationship with other people. Maybe there's something you need to change. You need to grow. And finally, finally, well, there's no problem at all with this statement, is there? If the request is right, if the timing is right, if you're right, God says, go. God says, let it be. And it happens. And we praise God and we celebrate and we sing. But before, oh gosh, I know it's noon, but before I leave this topic, there's one more thing I think I need to say. And that is, to be honest, to be perfectly honest, sometimes, sometimes, we just don't know. We just don't know why our prayer has gone unanswered. We have not been granted the petition that we have asked for. And that's where I point us toward this experience of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, I was given a thorn in the flesh. I was given a thorn in the flesh, and he makes no attempt to explain what that was. I think that's pretty smart. Because if we knew what Paul's thorn in the flesh was, we could say, well, that applies to Paul, but that doesn't apply to me, and that, this leaves the door wide open. I don't know what your thorn in the flesh may be, but there may be something in your life that hurts. And Paul said, I prayed to God three times that he would take that away from me. Now, the Bible uses numbers, sometimes in a very symbolic way. When Jesus and the disciples had that picnic on the hillside and fed 4,000, 5,000 people, some have said by ministerial estimate. Yeah, I think there's probably 250 here this morning by ministerial estimate. 
They say, and there were 12 baskets full left over. I mean, literally there could have been 12 baskets, but it's just a way of saying, and there was a lot. Jesus was able to supply their need and above and beyond what they needed. They all had some to take home. Like at the end of a potluck, they say, you want some to take home? Sure, sure. Sometimes they use the number seven. Seven bowls, seven trumpets, seven angels, seven seals. We say it's a number of perfect, perfectness, perfection. The number of fulfillment. So when Paul said I prayed three times, did he, does he really mean literally that I just, I just prayed three times about this? Or is he just saying I, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed about this? until I was totally exhausted with my pleading. And God said no. And we don't know why. But Peter did get, or Paul did get, some help. Most of our Bibles... Most of us carry, read from Bibles that have red letters in them, don't we? Red letter Bibles. Those are the words that Jesus spoke. Those are the words that the Son of God spoke. Those are the words that God spoke. Verse 9, if you'd ever look in your Bible, is in bright red letters. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace. In those moments, my grace is sufficient for you. It's not my gifts. It's not my stuff. It's not my miracles. It's not my guidance. It's not my healing. It's my grace that is sufficient to sustain you, to carry you through. We have been given the assurance that the grace of God is able to sustain us in all times of uncertainty, and in particular, in the uncertainty of unanswered prayer. It's kind of God's way of saying, I'm the answer. I am the answer. My presence, my love, my grace is the answer. And Paul said, knowing that when I'm weak, when I'm weak and I'm struck down and my knees are shaking and my mind and my heart don't understand, I'm strong in this. I'm strong in this. I can trust God because of his grace. Because of his grace. God's grace is always sufficient. That's our hope of salvation. That's our hope when we pray. My grace is sufficient. Shall we pray? Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for all those times when, yes, the request is right, the timing is right. When we are right in our relationships with you and with other people, and you say, go. Oh, what a joy, what a blessing. But Lord, when all those other times occur, we hurt. But we thank you for this final, final word that you said through you, to and through your servant, Paul. My grace is the answer. 
My grace is sufficient. Trust me. So, Lord, we trust you with unexplained things. We just trust you and trust the experience of your grace to sustain us in times like that. This is our hope through Christ. Amen.